Welcome back to Fox and Friends. Dave Briggs, he's Clayton Moore, she's Allison Camerata. We're going to head to Afghanistan this morning. One of the biggest obstacles in front of the U.S. troops there in Afghanistan is the opium trade. Ladies and gentlemen, our U.S. Marines are guarding opium in Afghanistan. You know, they have these opium fields, and we are tolerating it. We are tolerating the cultivation of the opium. If you plan on shooting up today, please only use federal government-sponsored heroin. Uh, here you have one of the best fighting forces in the world ever mounted. Uh, and in a sense, uh, you're watching as uh, this opium is being grown. I it is made from love and gumdrops. It is much better for your immune system the non-state-sponsored rival drug dealers. Well, uh, frankly, this is a part of their culture. So uh, while it might grind in my gut, it, it's what they do. Uh, we, we provide them security. We're providing them resources. Do not Google Iran-Contra. The Iran-Contra affair was one of the biggest political scandals in U.S. history. Members of the Reagan administration, headed by Oliver North, engaged in the sale of arms to Iran. The Iran-Contra is very important in history. We have to remember the fact that Iran-Contra, its mandate was to investigate the sales of missiles to Iran. Former DEA agent Celerino Castillo not only fought in the international effort of the American drug war, he also had the rare opportunity of carrying a camera and recording some of the regrettable actions of the DEA and CIA while they supported President Reagan and Oliver North's Contra movement. George Bush Sr. came to Guatemala on January 13, 1986. And he approached me and asked me what I did uh, there at the uh, U.S. Embassy, what my job description was. And I told him I was a DEA agent working uh, uh, international narcotics investigations and I told them look you know we have gathered intelligence that the cartels are involved in drug trafficking down in El Salvador and then he just smiled shook my hand and, and walked away from me and it was then and there that I knew that my government knew that these atrocities were occurring but it is good that our federal government gives us drugs they were so concerned about giving the guns to Iran and all that stuff the question should have been asked about all that cocaine flying back over, over here. In 1986, on American TV, we were all being fed a steady diet of... We're taking down the surrender flag that has flown over so many drug efforts. We're running up a battle flag. This scourge will stop. But regrettably, back in Central America and in the jungle... I remember down in Central America, we were refueling planes full of cocaine coming into the U.S and uh, it was a CIA uh, operation being run by the White House. You will find that the government brought in the crack cocaine to the ghettos. There's a great line in the movie Boys in the Hood where Larry Fishburne is saying, hey man, we don't grow it, we don't own any airplanes, we don't have any laboratories, how does it get here? Why does it get here? And that's a very good common sense approach that intuitively the people in South Central understood. But there was something much bigger than them uh, that was moving the whole drug issue and the drug war. Get ready to go with me on a riveting ride down the heroin highway from Burma to Bush. The film Air America reveals how George Bush's CIA dealt in heroin during the Vietnam War. President Reagan has appointed Vice President Bush as the number one policeman for controlling narcotic in the United States. Colonel James, Rambo Greitz, was the most highly decorated Green Beret hero in the Vietnam War. Bo's search for POWs and MIAs took him into the heart of the Golden Triangle. So I ask the White House aide, what about the uh, offer from General Kunza to cooperate with the United States in reducing the narcotic and controlling the amount coming through this area? You're about to hear from Colonel James Bo Greitz that the Bush boys had no interest in solving the drug problem. 
None whatsoever. The aid was very slow to answer. He said to me, Colonel Bo, there is no interest here in that matter. They financed the war using opium and heroin. Skull and Bones membership certainly has its privileges. At least three American presidents were or are Bonesmen. George W. Bush, his father George H. Bush, and William Taft. The proposition that this small club of the well-to-do pulls the strings of American power and through it those of the whole world by placing its associates in key power positions is supported by substantial evidence. One thing I'm going to be talking about is uh, secret societies and uh, drug trafficking networks. And well, the, the Order of Skull and Bones is a, is a secret society uh, that is uh, based at Yale University, been around uh, officially as the Order of Skull and Bones since uh, 1832. This is the clipper ship. And the, the China, China trade is a um, polite way of saying the opium business. And the opium business became the largest business in the world in the 1830s. And a lot of it is because of the clipper ship. The, uh, the Americans first started uh, smuggling opium uh, from Turkey uh, in the late 1700s. And it was mostly uh, the Boston uh, concern, uh, mostly people that were related to the, the Cabots, uh, the Perkins family. And um, then um, there got to be a lot of opium being smuggled out of India by the British East India Company. And some of the English people didn't think it was proper for the British East India Company, which had the king the, as, or the queen as part of its partners, to be involved in smuggling opium into China, where the Chinese didn't want it. So the British East India Company said, okay, well, I'll tell you what, we'll just grow the heck out of in India, but we won't send it in our ships anymore. So you had a couple of private concerns that developed. One, Jardine Matheson out of Scotland was the largest. Dent out of uh, England was the second largest. And uh, the Perkins concern and the Russell concern out of uh, the United States were the third largest, and they combined in the late 1830s. And the thing is, is that, like I say, the, the core group at Skull and Bones, they're all related to the Cabot families. Well... <coughs> Some of the best information about opium smuggling in the 18th century is in books about Cabot genealogy. With the, with the clipper ship, they were able to go to, once they got involved in the trade between uh, India and uh, Canton, they were able to take the clipper ship and make the trip there three times a year. And before that, it would sometime take them up to two years just to get from Canton to India and back. And now these ships could go there three times a year. So you can imagine, I mean, uh, the amount of opium going in uh, doubled ten, uh, ten times in, in just a, a few years. And actually, they got so much of it, and opium got to be such a big thing. Thank you.